well, here's this other thing. The, the EPA would, and this is what I said, the EPA would clean it and then they would try and back charge any of these PRPs. And though any of those PRPs could have been any of those people that we just talked about. So here's the problem. They actually blew through that $8 billion like a drunken sailor at a weekend pass so quickly that they actually needed more money. So they go back to Congress and they ask for more money. And they call that second act that was passed was called SARA. And that comes from the Superfund Amendment. And what does amendment means? Means they're going to change it. And we'll talk about that. And reauthorization, meaning giving them more money. So that's why you need to understand that CERCLA was called Superfund because they actually use that name in the second act. It's the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act. And if you saw the movie Stripes, and I love using analogies from movies because they're funny. In the movie Stripes, there was a guy talking to the drill sergeant, and he's like, hey, you call me Francis, I'll kill you. You touch my stuff, I'll kill you. Well, what did the drill sergeant say to him? He said, lighten up, Francis. So I use that because here's what Superfund or Sarah did. It is an amendment. So Sarah said, we will give you or reauthorize you more money, but dude, you got to lighten up. Those definitions of liability are way too constrictive. So Sarah said that there is a potential for a person to be innocent of this crime. And it is called the Innocent Landowner Immunity Act. If a person or an owner, when I say a person, I mean a company. If that company could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that they did not cause that problem, they could potentially be released as one of those PRPs. If they can prove that they didn't do it. Hey, it was literally caused by someone else. Maybe they brought, bought the property after it was created by someone else. Maybe those people lied on the environmental or the title work. And that new buyer thought they were buying property and found there was no damage. So they went ahead and bought it. So all of these things could potentially release a person from that liability under CERCLA when they amended it and created the SARA Act. Okay, so this now kind of helped out because they told CERCLA, dude, you're way too hard. Calm down a little. So when we're dealing with this, there were people that are uh, actually have the property and people that may be liable. Now, think back to, we talked about four attributes of value, demand, utility, scarcity. And this last one here was called transferability. At the time I set you up for a joke and now here's the punchline to that joke. I asked, how would you like to have been the bank? Well, actually, I asked, what does a $200,000 commercial property uh, value if it has a million dollar environmental cleanup? And you told me it has no value because you're actually upside down because no one would buy it. And that is the transferability. How easy is a property to transfer? Well, if it's only valued at 200 grand, but it has a million dollar cleanup, it can't be transferred. No one's going to pay five times what it's worth. Therefore, that's why you used to see, and in some cases still do, maybe abandoned gas stations sitting on the corner that 
is just sitting there. And everybody drives by and they're like, well, I wonder why that gas station's abandoned. Well, here's one potential reason. If that gas station is only worth 200 grand, but that company knows they've got leaking underground storage tanks and it's going to be a million dollars to clean it, it's actually cheaper just to let the property set. Now, there will come a time through the permanence of investment that this property value may eventually go up and it could change through several reasons. Maybe now that corner has become a bigger hub because there's a bunch of houses. So the demand has increased the value. Maybe the fact is just the true appreciation of property. At some point, that property may go to 1.2 million in value because it's sitting on a major corner. Now they can clean it up and actually make a profit when it sells. But let's go back to this scenario. If you want to buy this and you go to the bank and say, I want to borrow $200,000 and did not know it had a million dollars worth of cleanup and the bank loaned you the money, what are the odds they're going to see their money back? Probably not for a long, long time. So how would you like to have been the bank officer that okayed that loan? You don't. Therefore, that's how we protect it. They don't want lenders end up owning worthless property because of this situation. And there are a lot of ways to do that. You as an agent could have maybe uh, held liable because you did not take care of your client by suggesting what we're getting ready to talk about. Insurance companies may have a problem because now that that client's going to try and claim an insurance and they're, they may be in trouble. So there are things and ways to discover these environmental issues. Sorry, I had to take a short break. There are ways to discover these issues. Now, I have noticed that they are not actually listed in these notes. So I want you to make sure you're listening to me and write these two things down because they become very important. If you don't want to be the bank that gets on the hook for this, here's what typically happens in the commercial world. The seller will be required to do what's called a phase one environmental assessment. So before the bank actually loans the borrower the 200 grand in this example, the bank is going to tell the borrower, hey, dude, go ask the seller for their environmental site assessment called a phase one. Now, if you remember back, we talked about the chain of title. And the chain of title showed the pedigree, if you will, of ownership. Bob sold it, bought it from Amir, who bought it from Sally, who bought it from Juan, who bought it from Raymond. That's the chain of title. A phase one is a very analogous concept. It searches historical records, but now instead of actually looking at the owner, it actually looks at what was the property zoning and what was it being used for. So this was, I'm going to give you a really bad example so you can see. Residential to residential to residential to residential. Well, what are the odds that there is an underground storage tank being used in that residential property? The phase one is a desk audit, meaning the engineer sits at his desk and searches historical records and he sees this. That would be the answer to his phase one. What are the odds that this property has an underground storage tank 
that's going to cause it to have an environmental cleanup. In the example on the screen, they would go, well, probably very small. So they would say, no, there's no issues with this property. That phase one would then be signed off by a professional engineer. And you would go to the lender and go, hey, look, that scenario of a million dollar cleanup is probably not going to happen because a trained, educated person who did the phase one says that's not an issue. And now the bank says, OK, we'll loan you the money. Now, let me change the story. Supposing this desk audit, they found it was a gas station to a gas station to a gas station to a gas station. And this new buyer wants to buy it and he's going to put his flower shop on there. So he goes to the bank and says, hey, bank, I want to borrow $200, 200000 And they say, okay, have you got a phase one? And the borrower says, okay, let me go ask the seller. And the seller says, no, but I'll have one done. So he hires an environmental company who does a phase one, which again is a desk audit meaning they hit search historical documents, but they're looking for the zoning and the property use. And in that phase one search, he finds this pedigree. Now that engineer is going to go, dude, it's been a gas station for the last 80 years. I believe that there could be environmental issues. So they will sign off saying yes, that there probably is an environmental situation that may need to be handled. So now that borrower goes back to the lender and goes, here's the phase one. And the lender goes, <laughs> no way in hell, dude. We're not loaning you that money because we don't want to end up the punchline of that joke I just told you where they find out now there's a million dollar cleanup and the borrower only uh, only owes them 200 because they may never see it. So what happens is if this phase one comes back positive or with a yes recommendation, what will happen now is the environmental or the owner is going to contact that environmental company and say, okay, in your phase one, you said that yes, there was a probability. Let's find out. And the environmental company says, okay, we can do a phase two. Now, I've seen some people use uh, the Arabic number two. Uh, most of the time, I have always seen it in my practice as the Roman numeral two. But it's a phase two because they've already done phase one. Phase two is an actual invasive drilling on the property where they will take core samples of that property and they will take it to an environmental lab and then that environmental lab will follow a set procedure on how to test the soil to see if there is what we used to call straight eight, which is gasoline, oct octane eight, if their gas, if that soil is contaminated, what does that tell you about the storage tanks? Yes, they were leaking. Now that bank has truly dodged that punchline because they are going to say, no, this uh, phase two has come back with problems that are going to need to be cleaned and we are not going to be the ones on the hook. So, Mr. Borrower, we are not going to loan you the property. If you want to use your own money, i.e. buy it cash, that's up to you. But we're not going to loan you the money. So that phase two is just a actual invasive core drilling. Now, pretend that's my lot. There are actually specific methodology that this guy has to do this environmental company and i'm just giving you an idea where they may take eight nine ten twelve samples now depending on how big it is if it's 
three acres, they may take 50. Um, but they will take a so soil sample, and you have probably seen it in Jurassic Park. Remember, there's a big, long piece of soil, and that piece of soil is usually, you know, that big around, and it could be 16, 18, 20 feet long because that's how deep they went into the ground. Then that lab does a special, they follow a certain guidelines to determine and they come back with, yes, it's contaminated, or no, it's not contaminated. Even though it's been a gas station for the last 80 years, the soil shows no contamination. Therefore, the tanks are, in fact, intact and not leaking. If it comes back as contaminated, then there's a whole thing that has to happen. You know, that current owner is going to go, crap. So he's going to dig up all of this soil and haul it off, and he's going to put new soil in his place. And a lot of times you guys have probably seen signs along the road that say, like, clean, fill, dirt wanted, or a company that may be giving it clean, fill, dirt available. That's what, that's what it is. It's, they've got to put the dirt back in that hole, hole. So they would put clean dirt back into that hole, and pack it down and then sell the property, okay? So that would be how they discover these environmental situations is through this whole phase one and phase two, looking for some proof. Um, they request, the lender could request it, the borrower could request it, the buyer, which is obviously the borrower, could request it. and. There are other impact statements that could be done. Remember, that one was just looking for environmental or for leaking underground storage tanks. There could be other environmental impact studies that need to be created that could include things like noise. You know, you build 40 new houses right along a road or a highway, there could be some noise impact. There could be water quality issues. There could be population density that we talked about. There are wetlands. And when you start getting into those big housing developments of 50, 60, 100, 200 or 300, there typically are biological engineers or environmental engineers that work with these developers to create these studies so that the developer knows Hey, dude, I bought 80 acres, but I can't use the back 20 because that's a wetland. And we're building right next to a highway, so we're going to have to put a sound barrier up, or it's called a sound swale. And those are those hills that maybe you have seen in a lot of housing additions. That's to block sand or sound. So anytime there's a becoming more and more private development, these are starting to pop up the more and more, okay? There are environmental issues that maybe need to be disclosed, like lead-based paint. That's a federal one. Your state, Florida, I know, has a lot of disclosures about wetlands and protected land that cannot be developed because of all the marshes and stuff on it, all right? So understand that this chapter deals with all of that environmental issues that you may have inside the real estate transaction. So like I was saying, this chapter may deal with all of this stuff. Now, I am still going to tell you that probably your most common response to your buyer client to take care of them is literally going to be time out. I can't even pronounce chlorofluorocarbons, but I remember them in class. And as my job to take care of you, I think we better hire an environmental company. All right. As a listing agent, your job may be the same thing. Dude, you want to sell all of this industrial building? Have you done a phase one? Because you know it's going to be asked for by any borrower that's getting a loan. I suggest you get in touch with an environmental company. 
We are not environmental engineers, just like we're not attorneys. So the extent of our care is literally call somebody. We need to call somebody. I remember that word in class. I don't remember what it means, but I know it's a problem. We better check into it. All right. Once again, questions down here. There are questions in the ebook. If you have other questions or want to talk about real estate, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com and uh, hope to see you again. See you next chapter. Bye.